Okay, good. All right, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi man wala. Let me see your book, the questions there. Wissam, did you, uh, are you able to say for this one? Yeah. This one? Okay, good. All right. <coughs> so yesterday we looked at ma huwa al-kalam, the first definition in this uh, uh, text, al-ajrumiyya, ma huwa al-kalam. All right. And al-kalam has four parts. Al-kalam huwa al-lafd, al-murakkab, al-mufid, bil wada all right. <coughs> All right. So, Wisam, ma ma'na kawnihi lafzan? What does it mean to say that al kalam must be a lafz? What does that mean? Good. A lafz is that which is spoken. All right. All right. Uh, Hamza, murakkaban. Murakkaban. Good, complete. Murakkab uh, or multiple words, as opposed to simply saying one thing. Murakkab. Uh, and then maldu'an, bilwada uh, means that it's uttered in the Arabic language. Okay. Now the, we said Arabic is divided into three. Every every word is either ism, fi'al, or harf. All right. The ism is known by khaf. Kasra, okay, or tanween, or dukhul al alif wal lam, okay, or dukhul huruf al khaf. Of course, the alif and lam being the article that makes something uh, specific as opposed to general. And huruf al khaf min wa ila wa an wa ala wa fi wa rub wa ba wa kaf wa lam, and then huruf al qasam wa hi al wa wa ba wa ta min. Being from ila meaning to, an meaning uh, by or uh, about, okay, ala being above, all right, or regarding, uh, fi being in, rubba meaning perchance, okay, alba meaning with, okay, or by. Marartu bi Zaydin, okay, or al kaf meaning like, and then lam meaning two, and then huruf al qasim the oath letters, and then we said al fi'al yu'arafu bi qad wa sin wa sawfa wa ta'at ta'nith al sakina. All right, so the fi'al is known by qad coming before it, and we said qad is a, a word of harf of emphasis that if a past tense verb comes in front of it. Okay, it means it's certain that it happens. All right. قَدْ جَاءَ قَدْ For sure the believers have succeeded. Or, if it's followed by a present tense, فِعَ الْمُضَارِعَ قَدْ يَلْعَبْ الْأَوْلَادِ Right? Or قَدْ يَأْتِي الرَّجُلْ Maybe the man will come. It means maybe. All right? The purpose of it, the effect is to put something into a state of not, not certainty. Basically, uncertainty. Okay, and then we have seen sofa and ta ta'nit the second. Seen and sofa. <coughs> okay, uh, here we go. Seen and sofa take the fi'al mudara and render it into a fi'al that is still mudara, but it means the future tense. So English has past, uh, present, and future. Okay, that's in English has past, present, future. Arabic has past, uh, command, and uh, present slash future, right? And command. Okay. Well, can you translation? Translation. Sure. Like I'm saying, uh, can you kindly shut the water off on the outside? The wall. Yeah, the water. All right, <coughs> so now we're on chapter two, lesson two, okay? Uh, we finished Al-Kalam, and now we're on lesson two. Al-I'rab. So the function of this text is to teach you something called I'rab, all right? I'rab. And that's what the function of Nahu is. Remember we said Arabic is divided into three sciences. 
Al-Nahu was Sarf wal Balagha. Nahu is focused on sentence structure. Sentence structure, the way it works, is by altering the ending of words to indicate the part of speech. Okay? The alteration of the ending of the word. So, when we're talking about I'rab, our main focus here is the last letter of the word. Uh, leaving aside suffixes. All right, so you could have a you could have a damir muttasil, a pronoun added to a word. We're not focusing on that. We're focusing on the last letter of every word. Okay, so here he says, "Al i'rabu huwa taghiru awakhir al kalimi liqtilaf al awamil al dakhilati alaiha lafzan aw taqdira." Okay, i'rab, which you could translate it as inflection is the change of the last syllable of words based on the various agents of inflection that govern them either explicitly or implicitly because some i'rab cannot be placed because of difficulty on the tongue or that two letters were too similar so we can't place for example a kasra on certain letters right so that's why he says implicitly all right, so again, this very definition is very important. The whole purpose of studying nahu or grammar is that when you're reading the Quran, you understand why there's u, e, or a, and anyone who's reading Quran or memorizing Quran, it's critical to understand why something has a dhamma or a kasra or a fatha. And then when you're reading a text, you also don't want to be ignorant, okay, and not know what's happening. So again, he says, Al-I'rab huwa taghiru awakhir al-kalim Changing the ending of words لِاخْتِلَافِ الْعَوَامِلِ الدَّاخِلَةِ عَلَيْهَا Because of the different agents that are entering in upon this word. Okay? لَفْضًا أَوْ تَقْدِيرًا Either it's explicit or it's implicit. Alright? So what are possible agents that enter in upon a word? The idea of a word being the subject of the sentence. Right? Being the one that's actually doing the action. This is one agent. This is a type of thing. That situation on that word. It's going to render it to be what we call marfu'a. Alright? Marfu'a. Alright? Marfu'a is the uh, type of law that comes upon the subject of a sentence. The, the part of sentence that's doing the action. Alright? And depending on the, the nature of the word, plural, feminine, dual, singular, masculine, depending on the nature of the word, the concept of rafa takes a different application. Either dhamma, or waw noon, or alif noon. And we'll, he's going to flesh all that out. Honestly, the next chapter, chapter 3, which we'll probably open up today, if you get chapter 3, that's the whole book. Everything else is easy after that. Actually, all of lugha is the op- they say it's the opposite of fiqh. Fiqh starts off easy, like tahara and salah, right? Then it gets hard. Once you go to buyu'ah, and you go to the different types of zakah, and you go to the mirath, the inheritance, it gets hard. Arabic is the opposite. It starts off very hard with this simple concept, but once you get it, you're off and running. It's very easy after that. Now he says, وَأَقْسَامُهُ <clears> arba'a. <throat> Now, you can't really, in the English language, does not, uh, the English language, of course, you know, is a combination of Germanic, it's at Germanic origins, and Latin. That's why the spelling is always different. So, food and good, they're spelled the same, but they're totally different, right? Food and good, things like this. Uh, The spelling in English, like you have skate, but you have schedule, total different spellings. Because English is a combination of like a Germanic origin and Latin. So it's not a classical language. It's mixed. Sanskrit, Arabic, okay, other languages are classical language, meaning they're pure, they're not a combination of other languages. Okay? Urdu is a complete mutt of like Persian, Turkish, Arabic, probably uh, Sanskrit, Farsi, Persian. So English does not have this concept of cases, right? Cases. You have in English what? You have the word, and you have the part of speech, and it's almost like you just plug it in, right? It's like you just plug it in. 
wherever you plug in the word cat, it's going to be cat, whether it's object, subject, right, part of a prepositional phrase, whatever. But other languages, such as Russian, okay, Arabic, and other languages, have a concept of cases. Namely, you have the word cat. Where you put it, the word that word ending will change. Okay, if you put it as a subject, if you make it the cat, it's going to change. If you make it as an object, it's going to change. Now, just for some people need to know, uh, even these terms: subject is the doer of the verb, object is the recipient of the action. If you have a sentence with only what we call in English a helping verb, like have or is or are, then we call that sentence structure subject and predicate. Right? The cat is big, so you got a subject, helping verb, and predicate. Okay, so <clears throat> Arabic we have two types of sentence: a sentence that has a verb, and the sentence that doesn't have a verb. The sentence that doesn't have a verb has a non-spoken, what we would call in English, a helping verb. But in Arabic, those verbs don't exist. There's no helping verb, right? So you don't, you just have a subject and a predicate, all right? Probably, if you trace the difference in the grammar, you can probably trace most Arabic accents. Why people speak like the way the Arabs speak the way they do is he's translating directly. Cat big, right? Because in English, Arabic, there's no helping verb, right? Al qittatu kabiratun, right? So he's saying he's going to say the cat's big, because that's how he translated it directly. There's no helping verb. We call this jumla ismiya, jumla ismiya, okay? But if there is a verb, all right, the cat ate the uh, fish, all right. The difference between English and Arabic is that the verb comes first. Ate the cat the fish, all right. So, the I'rab cases are four. Aqsamu arba'a. Rafa, wa nas, wa khaf, wa jazb. Alright? We're going to only just look at two today to make a comparison between the two. The dominant case is called Rafa. Rafa. Which is in English, if you look at the, these books like Al Kitab or the other books, they call it the nominative case. It's the dominant case. Okay. And this rafa is applied to the subject in the verbal sentence. All right? The subject of a verbal sentence. And it's applied to the subject and the predicate of a nominal sentence. Jumla ismiya. So if we said there are five parts of speech, three for the verbal sentence and two for the nominal sentence. For the verbal sentence, jumla fi'liya, verb, subject, object. Okay? Ate the cat, the fish. And then for the nominal sentence, you have the subject and predicate, which we call in Arabic, mubtada and khabar. Okay? Uh, the cat is big. Okay? The nominative case, or rafa dominates over the subject of the verbal sentence and both parts of speech of the Jumla Ismiya. Okay, both parts of speech of the Jumla Ismiya. All right. So again, you have fi'al, fa'il maf'ul bihi, verb, subject, object, and the fa'il will be marfu'a. The fa'il will be marfu'a, and in the nominal sentence. Mubtada and khabar, both will be marfu'a. The case is called a rafa. Alright? We call the case itself a rafa. And then when it's applied to a word, that word becomes called marfu'a. Alright? Now, let's go to alamatu rafa. What are the signs of rafa? When he means the signs of rafa, means rafa is going to stamp this, the fa'il, the subject. And it's going to stamp the 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 mubtada uh, and the khabar in the nominal sentence. The stamps are four types of stamps. Number one, al dhamma. Number two, al waw. Number three, al alif. Number four, al noon. Okay, al dhamma tu wal waw wal alif wal noon. Okay, dhamma waw alif al noon. Now. If you look, I don't know which book you have, Wissam. 
but there's got to be charts in either book that you have there's got to be charts an Arabic word can only be uh, certain types this you got a set number of options we're now talking about the words masculine or feminine okay in Arabic you only have two genders imagine if they had to modernize the Arab so wait a second I recently saw a tweet progressive Muslim youth camp in Canada right if you're gonna do that and you're gonna have like 20 genders you gotta fix up the Arab right you're gonna have to fix up your Arab because our Arab I guess it discriminates and it only limits to two genders okay Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّا خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنثَى Period. End of ayah. Right? <laughs> Human being is either male or female. So, there's only two genders in the language. Masculine or feminine. But there are three uh, numbers. It could be singular, dual, or plural. Right? So that's two times three. Right? Is six. Okay? So you can have singular... Uh, masculine singular masculine dual masculine plural then you could have feminine singular feminine dual feminine plural all right but then you have one other tricky thing which is broken plural right broken plural okay which gives you how much total seven seven okay all right so we're going to talk about these seven. If I'm going to put a word, one of these seven words, as a subject, fa'il, what's it going to look like if it's marfu'a? So give me a singular, masculine singular. Actually, let's start with the feminine so they don't say anything about us. Right? Let's start with a feminine singular word. What's a feminine singular? Huh? Kura, right? Ba, kura. So it's feminine because it ends with samarbuta, right? So if kura is a fa'il, a verb, you're going to put a, let's say al kura, you're going to put a dhamma upon it. Al kuratu, right? Dakhalat al kuratu al shabaka, the ball entered the net, okay? So it's going to be al kuratu. Now if I was to make, say, rama al waladu al kura, if I was to say the ball, the boy threw the ball, and I rendered the ball to be the object of the sentence, then I would say Rama al waladu al kurata. So that's a difference right there in a simple feminine singular. If it's the subject, it's going to be al kuratu. If it's the object of the action, it's receiving the action, it's going to be al kurata. So very simple for someone opening the Quran now. When you see a feminine singular word, okay, kuratu al al kurata, you know now one is the doer and one's the recipient of the action. All right, so that's feminine singular. Let's keep going down to the feminine, feminine, feminine dual. Okay, feminine dual. Feminine dual. Okay, let's say there are two balls. If it's the subject, it's gonna be with the alif noon. Okay, you need something? Yeah. Right. If it's gonna be the sfail, all right, marfua, it's gonna be al kuratan, alif noon, al kuratan. Okay. Dakhala al kuratan al shabaka. The two balls entered the net. Right? Or Rama threw Al Waladu, the boy. Now it's now the object. So what's it gonna be? Al Kuratain. Okay? So an for the object for subject and ain when it is the recipient of the action. Alright? Um Dharaballahu Methalan Dharaballahu Methalan Methala Imra Atain. Right? Mra'atu Nuh and Mra'atu Lut. Right? Allah struck the example of who, of what? Of two women. Imra'atain. Right? Imra'atain. And then, for example, Musa alayhi salam, when he came upon the well, what did he see? Imra'atan. 
right? Tadudan. He found two women waiting, right? To get their water. So when a dual feminine is going to be the subject, it's going to receive an. And when it is the object of the sentence receiving the action, it's ain. Right? Umbraatan umbraatain. So now we go to feminine plural. Alright? Feminine plural. Like Al Mu'minat. Alright? Mu'minat. Okay? <clears throat> when the Mu'minat are the fa'il, subjects of the action, they will receive the Dhamma. Al Mu'minat tu. Alright? Al Mu'minat tu. Alright? Dakhala al Mu'minat tu, or Dakhalna al Mu'minat tu al Masjidah, for example. So, believing women enter the, the mosque. Al Mu'minatu. Alright? Or, now when it's the object, what happens? Right? Here you have an exceptional case. And I hate to bring exceptions to you so early. But you have to put an asterisk here. Okay? Because, in theory, it would be Al Mu'minata. Right? Al Mu'minata. However, the original speakers of this language found this to be difficult on the tongue and found it easier to put a kasra. So, al mu'minati. Okay? Now, how does this come in the Quran many times? A number of times. We have a verbal sentence about the creation of the heavens and the earth. Khalaq is the verb created. Allahu. Alright? Allah created. Khalaq Allahu. As-samawati wal-arda. Both of them are objects of the creation. They're receiving the creation. They are the object. They're not creating. They've been created. Okay? They're receiving the action from Allah Azza wa Jal. So they are both objects. So they should get fatha. However, like we just said, the feminine plural object or mansub case is an exception. It does not get a fatha. It gets a kasra. Okay, and I hate to actually bring that up in the first uh, second lesson, but it's something you could easily remember when you say خلق الله السماوات والأرض الأرض fits what we just said, right? Like رمى الولد الكرة Okay, خلق الله الأرض. However, uh, feminine plural is an exception. It will not receive a fatha. It will receive a kasra. Okay. <laughs> Alright, so how many words did we do? Feminine singular? Examples. We gave examples. Feminine dual? We gave examples. Feminine plural. Now let's go to the masculine. Uh, Wissam, give me a masculine singular word. Al Muslimu. Okay. Muslimu. So again, very simple. It's going to be either receiving a Dhamma or a Kasra. Right? Uh, because it's the object of the action so it's going to get a fatha al-muslimu is the doer so he's going to get a dhamma now if it's two دخل المسلمان right المسجد alright so it's going to be marfu' with adding alif noon to the end of the word okay and if it's plural, right? If it's plural, it will be Dakhala al Muslimun al Masjidah. Right? The plural Muslims enter the masjid. So the rafa upon the masculine plural is with the waw noon. Right? Waw noon. Okay? And if it's the object, if Muslims are the object, for example, خاطب الإمام المسلمين. The Imam gave his khutbah, his speech, address to the Muslims. So you're going to say خاطب, right? خاطب. Many people make this mistake. خاطب, okay, is to address with a speech. خاطب is to get engaged. Many people make this mistake, right? So خاطب he addressed. Who, who did the addressing? Al-Imamu with the subject. Al-Imamu. And the plural is 
al muslimin so when you have plural fem, uh, masculine plural as the recipient of the action you're going to add a ya noon all right so when people are reciting the quran and reading the quran now you know the difference between wa noon and ya noon if you see ya noon is the recipient of an action or part of a prepositional phrase it is not the doer but when you see wa noon that is the doer and the main uh, actor in the sentence okay wa noon versus ya noon so khataba al imam al muslimin we call that mansub with the ya mansub and the indicator of the nasb there all right is the yet we haven't introduced formally introduced the word nasb but it's the corollary of a rafa we just said a rafa is the mark upon the subject of the sentence and nasb is the mark upon the object of the sentence okay and we call the first word marfu and the second word mansub all right khataba al imam al muslimin al imam okay fa'il marfu bid al imam okay al muslimin maf'ul bihi object mansub receives nasb with what bil ya all right mansub bil ya is there, are you all following you got the stuff hamza you know this stuff already right from any why this is it's good to review all right so now we have one more case which is what the broken plural all right so uh the lugha the language has a situation where not all plurals are clean plurals so what is um uh, a plural that is salim or clean the word doesn't change like muslim you just tack on well noon right uh feminine muslima you just tack on alif ta muslimat so the root stays the same okay however some plurals you have to break up the root in some way shape or form like kitab kitab becomes kutub fiha kutubun qayyima okay ikhfa fiha kutubun qayyima so kutub you take the word kitab you have to break it up you have to take the alif out right and you have to alternate how it sounds kutub so kutub just like feminine singular and just like masculine singular the indicator of the rafa is the dhamma okay right for example uh al kutubu qayyimatun this is a subject predicate phrase nominal sentence no verb mubtada khabar right al kutubu qayyimatun the books are valuable okay or let's take a verbal sentence and make the book to be uh, the object, the maf'ul bihi. All right. So you're going to say now, okay, qara al al All right. The student read the books. Qara read al the student al the books. Okay. All right. So is this clear? With everyone? I have a question. Yeah. Um, does uh, Jama, Jama Taksiya, that's a broken plural, right? Uh huh. Does, so does, does that become feminine? No. So that means that uh, he had Kutub al Qayyima. Is Qayyima feminine? That's because, okay, that's a good question. The question is Al Kutub, all right, was given an adjective. The adjective was made feminine. Now we know, we haven't gotten to this lesson yet, but some people know out there that the adjective and a noun have to have exactly the same number gender and everything okay the non-human plural is always described with the feminine in most cases feminine singular right in most cases right but the gender the non-human plural will always be treated as a feminine so that's for and the salem case yeah salem or otherwise any non-human plural will be treated as feminine Okay, and in in contemporary Arabic, always singular, but in the Quran, in classical Arabic, can be singular or plural. Okay. All right. Let's see what on what else anyone has here. All right. 
All right. Now, <clears throat> some people asked another question when we said, uh, when we talked about the verb, which we haven't gotten to that yet, but just as something some people are asking for. Uh, a verb, when we start a verbal sentence, we always keep it singular. The verb is always singular when we start. All right. It could be feminine or masculine. All right. But the verb, when we start, is always singular. So we'll get to that when we get to verbs. Okay? All right, so let's stop here because we don't want to make these, each lesson too long. All right? And we've been going for how long? I don't know how many, maybe 20, 30 minutes now. So let's pause here. And then um, we have half an hour. Do you want to do fiqh now, right away? Stop and do fiqh right away? Isn't it one thirty? So that was one thirty. Salah, the ikam, the adhan or the ikam? I just got a notification from the app. From the app? I mean, I see app. <laughs> okay, so let's pause here. I'm pretty sure the salah is at one thirty though. Ikam, could you check on the wall real quick? Because if... one fifteen. Okay, so they changed it. All right, so let's stop here. After salah, we will uh, come back and read some food. All right.